it's just a huge honor to be in Sydney, Australia. Sitting here talking to Emmanuel Recupero. Hi. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Um, I really like what you're doing with Dental ED because um, education really hasn't had a lot of innovation. I mean, you go back to uh, the schools in America and, and that business model of a teacher standing out in front of a room with 30 students hasn't really changed in 300 years. And, and you started Dental ED is a recognized leader, provider of advanced dental training and practice development. His integrated training services have been developed by the most respected names in dentistry. He has advanced a level of dental knowledge for thousands of dental professionals around the world for over 16 years. Enhance your learning journey with the world's best dental educators via their online courses, study clubs, and workshops anywhere in the world. Emmanuel Recupero started um, as a microbiologist and then worked in the pharmaceutical industry for seven years. In 1997, he started his marketing consulting company, providing strategic marketing solutions to the medical industry and then dental. He then started Dental ED in 2003 with the idea of making high-end education more accessible to dentists. Um, so basically, um, this is a real innovation. So basically, you started a long time ago, 2003, probably before anyone, with online dental education. Yeah. Yeah. So right. tell us about was, your journey. Was, how, how how did that happen? How did it happen? Were, were you born in Italy? No, I was born in Australia. I'm uh, my parents are Italian, so I am first generation Australian, and um, they immigrated out in the '60s, and so I uh, did a science degree, and in microbiology, microbiology as a major, and worked in a hospital for about six months, and felt that this is really not what I wanted to do. So I did. A, was going to go into research and then I decided to leave and work in, as a microbiologist and I found the whole culture a little bit too weird for me, so I had to get out. Um, and Who were weirder, the people or the bacteria? <laughs> Both. <laughs> um, so we, you know, uh, a person came into the lab one day and she worked for Park Davis, I think it was, and I thought, wow, well, she's got a car and she can talk to people and she can manage her own time and she drives around. I thought, this is really what I want to do. So I applied for a job and I got a job with an American company called Syntex. And um, they were based out of Minnesota, I think, I can't remember exactly, but um, they made Naproxen. So have you ever heard of Naproxen? Yeah, an analgesic. An analgesic, an anti inflammatory ibuprofen. So they invented ibuprofen, I think. And um, I worked for them for about three years. And then from there, I moved over to Roche and really uh, was involved a lot in the marketing and sales part of uh, the industry and, and got very well trained. And then it was time for me to leave. And I felt that I probably could provide this knowledge and expertise from the pharmaceutical industry that they do so well in what they do in terms of marketing and strategizing and selling that I thought I could apply that in the medical industry and so I provided a consulting service and that went for uh, from 1997 to about 2003 and was doing well it was called it medical marketing services or MMS and then I came across uh, I started to do some work for some dentists it was a little bit too early then well, every dentist was too busy for marketing that was just not really needed in 2003 um, to about 2002, 2001, 2002, still too early. People were starting to make, uh, marketing people were starting to come into it, but there were far and few between. There was uh, Roger Levine uh, at the time. Uh, and, you know, there was even people sort of, the internet technology was sort of in its infancy. You started coming up as well in that time, and I remember very well. But back then, the average dentist in Australia was booked a month in advance. Oh. Six weeks was the average, even Six more. Six weeks was even, the average. Even, even, even up to two to three months sometimes. So it was really... Yeah, no one wanted practice no, management. It was like, no. my God, that was... They wanted practice management on how to uh, streamline the practice, but not how to build a practice. I didn't want to build a practice anymore. It was just too much work. Even to get, you know, a new recruit, a new student who just graduated, a new grad, um, was just so difficult. They, they would pay anybody to get into the practice. It was just that difficult. And so marketing was not really an in thing at the time. 
So um, I came across an orthodontist who um, we sort of, uh, you know, I did a marketing plan, a strategy plan for him, and he introduced me to the concept of study clubs. And I understood the model of the study club, and I thought, well, look, there's got to be a better way to get really cost-effective education, especially in Australia being so far and remote. We had it, the education that we had was quite incestuous. Um, same, same people, same, same study club presenters with the same material pretty much and I thought you know there are all these textbook people that have all these wonderful wonderful wisdom to share but no one's ever heard them you know they only know them by that name and I thought well how are we going to do this cost effectively to get such high caliber information out there and that's where we looked at towards the internet and we were talking about dial-up in those days and AOL AOL that's right AOL and uh and what year was you starting that? Well, we started, the idea was around about early, mid, late 2002. Early. When I started Dental Town, it was 1998. The AOL dial-up, I mean, you'd have to call three or four different numbers. Exactly. And I was, um, I was just going to put everything I had into Dental Town. Yeah. And I can remember my dad, my sister, my ex-wife standing in the kitchen crying for the whole day, telling me how insane this was. Because the early internet, and that's why Jeff Bezos, when he started the internet, he only sold books yeah. because that was um, the only thing you could sell with a text. Yeah. He wanted to disintermediate direct mail, but most of the direct mail that he wanted to go into, which was cooking and fashion, all needed a picture. And he said, we're going to have to start with books because the internet pipes won't be big enough to exactly. send down a picture. And then, so then you were even later with a video. I mean, we were trying um, <laughs> an impossible feat uh, over dial-up, which was trying to transmit high-resolution photos or imagery, slide projection, as well as have a, a video and um, voice, and try and sort of emulate some level of liveness uh, about that presentation into a venue. So dentists wanted to see their presenters live, watching it on the big screen, you know, um, it's got to feel real. So we had a real big challenge, and by some coincidence, during that time, it was like in that week, I got an e-blast. And it was about this new technology that came out, which was called Centra. And it pre-downloaded a lot of the content onto the hard drive and only streamed the audio. So that's how it got around this. And it was, it was pretty revolutionary at the time. It was a, a no, no, no other web collaborating software even WebEx couldn't do it at the time. Um, so this was kind of a, a real big milestone. So um, we trialed the idea of bringing in a number of venues and having a live speaker um, and testing that to see if it works. Well, we did that in June 2003. It was a disaster. But we did get a partial transmission out. And it was the first time that web conferencing was used in dental nice so that was so we were almost going to pack up and say no this is not going to work we didn't get the support of the dental association they didn't think it was going to work and there was a lot of people very negative about it but there was also a lot of people saying look this is the future so we thought well let's give it another try but let's do it bigger this time let's get an american speaker and do it from overseas and transmit it into Australia. And so that's what we did. We got 12 venues and we had a total of about 700 dentists all watching. And we had a- uh, From 700 from Australia? Yeah, because you've got 12 venues and in each venue there was 50 or 60 dentists. So you add them up and that's how you got the numbers. And who was your speaker? We had Rick Robley from the US. Rick Robley. Rick Robley. He, he Robley? Robley. How do you spell that? R O B L E. Huh. So he's a both a prosodontist and an orthodontist and he did a presentation. It was live in those days. There was no recording. So he was up at three in the morning doing this presentation. Yeah. Um and it was successful. It went through and it worked. And that was the birth of Dental Ed. And since then, we've had John Coyce, uh, Gordon Christensen, um, Ron Goldstein, you name it. We've had plenty of people on the program. Over, We've done now nearly 300, 400, 350, 400 lectures live. Wow. 
Now, do you archive all those lectures yeah, so we, someone someone can go back later and watch all of them? Um, we don't release them. Um, we've got them in our private collection as a memorial thing. Um, some of those things are yeah. a bit dated now, but some of them are still there. So, so the the element is still live. That's a the well, we've changed our model. We, we had a few experiences where um, the speaker went down and the whole network goes down, and so we thought, you know, after restless sleep i decided look there's got to be a better way yes a safety recording net so we did a backup recording and then we gradually developed our own software which we could launch that recording remotely on everyone's computer at the same time and shut it down and then go into live q a so we only have the speaker online for about uh 15 to 20 minutes it's surprising even today do you do you remember johnny carson and the tonight show yeah did they show that over here? Yeah. Oh, I didn't, I didn't know that was an Australian He's dead show. now, isn't he? Yeah, he's yeah. dead. Um, yeah, he died shortly after he retired. Yeah, I that's right. I think he died of emphysema, didn't he? Something like that, yeah. Um, but, um, you know, um, I went and watched... Uh, my mom uh, and dad wanted to see that show live. So we went to uh, Hollywood and saw his show in Arsenio Hall. And um, but Johnny walked out there and he said, these these shows that are live, he goes, that that's a hell of a lot of risk and... And he goes, you know, I come in here and we just shoot this in the afternoon. There's no pressure. Um, if someone forgets their line or screws mm. up a joke. And and um, I, I look at a lot of these other venues like Saturday Night Live, you know, where it's all live for a live audience. But, you know, the people in L.A. aren't watching it live. They're Correct. three hours later. And, and uh, I um, it's a lot of stress going live. And a lot of it's unnecessary. So that's what you kind of figured out. Well... Yeah, that's how I lost uh, half my hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, I lost all of mine. I didn't do any live, but um, yeah. So look, it's it's, but it, that's what dental ed really is. It, it's sort of like an event uh, management company. We provide a lot of courses and a lot of lectures and and a lot of study club lectures. You and, have you have a, an office also in America. We do. We run with a, in partnership with a, a group called Vision Trust, Jeff Bean, and he's based in Colorado. So, yes. Vision Trust. Yes. And Jeff Bean, what, what does he do for you in America? He is, he, well, it's, um, Dental Aid has a partnership agreement with many com uh, with countries. Some of them are sole um, partnerships. It's a, it's a difficult model to explain, but some countries are sole partnerships with dental ed and the others have other businesses that they run and vision trust happens to be one of them that they have their own business and dental ed is one of those services that they run Can as a product that, Ryan? vision trust yeah, yeah vision trust i mean jeff beans are well, well respected in the orthodontic industry as well as some of the gp in gp land and he's got a, a specialty in facebook oh so he's a dentist no he's not he's, he's a consultant oh he's a consultant yeah so he he does a lot of um, speaking on uh, Facebook, how to use Facebook. Nice. So for the dental industry. Yeah. yeah. Now, you also are putting hands-on courses because um, you have a hands-on with Maxim Belgrade, who we podcasted when um, we were, Maxim and I were both lecturing um, at the South African Dental Association in Johannesburg. So I uh, convinced him after his seminar and after he was tired and exhausted and wanted to go to bed. Uh, to come back to the hotel room and do a podcast, and he did. So you're doing what? So you're doing hands-on and? Yeah, we do. We do. Um, we're in about eleven countries. Uh, we run study clubs, and we run hands-on courses in those countries. So um, for like inlays, onlays, crown? anything. Well, pretty much aesthetic. We're more towards aesthetic dentistry. We have done implants. Um, we, so, I mean, we work with the top end speakers, Pascal Manier. Um, wow. You know, he's so, from Brazil. No, he's from America. Oh, <laughs> UCLA. UCLA. Yeah. And, uh, no, Southern California. Um, who else? Gallup Gorel. Um, we worked with a few good names out there and Newton Fowle. He was he's from Brazil. Yeah, he's from Brazil. So yeah. you would. No, that, I confuse him with Newton Yeah, Newton Fowle. composite guy. So. Yeah. And that's how we started, actually. Newton Fowler's the one, the first course we were thrown into, which is a pretty intense course to start. So we started from study clubs, then we went to hands-on courses, and now we're sort of progressing into um, advanced marketing software as well now. So what's, so um, 
So what's the difference between online and hands-on? Hands-on is where we, at the moment, it's not online. It's where they're in a venue and they, haven't you, have you ever been to a hand, you, oh, you, you I, used I, to I, practice as a dentist? No, I, I, I still practice, I've been practicing 30 okay. years ago. What I, what I meant by that is, do you, do you, um, I could watch um, Newton Fall or Pascal um, do a direct composite and aesthetic case. Yep. But do you think the dentist learns more with uh, show touch feel, working with the materials, the hands on? Um, is, is there is there different? Is is um, online more didactic? And there, I mean, what, what what do you think is the focus more of online versus hands on? I think it the the advantages of online is that it's accessible. Um, perhaps more cost effectively for a lot more dentists um, so lower cost online lower, lower cost, cost. Uh, easy reach as well as perhaps um, convenient convenience is an important thing for a lot of dentists um, hands-on is a different experience there is a speaker there and and you know you are you are with your peers I mean dentists are social creatures you know they don't like being in the practice alone all the time they need to go out there and learn as a group um, they feel they get quite a, a lot of value doing that. Um, they share their own experiences amongst each other as well as being in the presence of the speaker. And, and sometimes being around that speaker that they admire so much and getting that feely touchy and, and closeness to that whole experience is very important. I think that's, that's part of what a hands-on experience is about. Yeah. A lot of the techniques that they learn is is repetitive in some ways and it's just a reassurance that they're learning the right or they're doing the things correctly sometimes it's new um, but being in the presence of their their mentors is really what it's all about and yeah um, would, you, would you agree on that yeah I do it's kind of like um, movies and books I mean you know I have so many family friends that you know they'll only read the book Hmm. And if they ever do go to the movie, all you hear about is how and the book was the, better. The book was better, and I'm always trying to explain to my sisters. Well, it took you six hours to read the book, yeah. but the movie was only two hours. Yeah. So you can't you can't do a six hour movie. I remember Oliver Stone. There's only like a handful of uh, people alive today that have made over sixty films, hmm. and Oliver Stone has lectured extensively on the challenges. Because a lot of people complain. Like, I remember in his movie Watergate, all the critics were like, you said this guy did this and this, and that was actually two separate guys, and that's a fact. Your movie's a fallacy. You know, it, it was. it's a factual flaw. Mm. And all of mm. was like, dude, I don't have time to introduce another character. I knew that was two characters, mm. but for a shortcut, I had one character do two different human stuff Correct. because I'm, I've got it, I got this time span. But yeah, I, I think that um, some people, like I always learn the most dental information reading the textbook. But I know very few people want to sit in a chair, you know, the whole weekend and kill a three, four, five hundred page textbook. It's quite surprising that a lot of dentists do love good quality textbooks. They, they, they do learn a bit, but then it's about applying it. And that's where the hands-on comes into it. Um, a lot of the, you know, a lot of these people, a lot of dentists that go to the courses where we bring some of these speakers out do read their textbooks before they come. But it's just bringing the knowledge and the information all together, sometimes in a practical sense, is really what it's all about. So what will my homies find if they go to dentaledglobal.com? Well, they'll find um, basically the... the uh, our study clubs and our study club program and uh, and you said you're in 11 countries yeah i think there's about 11 there and what what are, what are your 11 countries india china us indonesia singapore taiwan hong kong um new zealand australia um you're testing me now i'm no i'm going to be embarrassed because i'm going to forget a few well you picked the foremost part of uh, China is the number one populace, billion three. India is number two, a billion two. America is number three, three hundred and twenty-five million. But most people don't realize Indonesia is number four. It's they have two hundred and twenty-five million people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's I big, mean, it's a huge country. It and it's, it, it it's a very big country. Um, and it's spread out over ten thousand islands, right? Yes. 
and Philippines is spread out over 7,000 islands. So, um, mm. man, what a what a infrastructure challenge for Indonesia. I mean, you can't have roads and bridges to connecting 10,000 islands. I mean, it's hell a lot you... of plane flights. Oh yeah, <laughs> you, you couldn't even you couldn't even run internet cable to 10,000 yeah, islands. It's quite interesting flying over Indonesia. It's just forest. Forest, forest. It's, yeah. all, it's amazing how much forest there is in Indonesia. They're slowly getting rid of it, but it's still a lot of forest. Yeah. Um, but it's an interesting country. It's still in the development phase. And, you know, um, it, we, we, the beauty of it is that we're in there and helping dentists with their level of education, bringing them up. Um, you know, not to say that they are, you know, disadvantaged. They have access to material, but we're bringing the courses in there and, and changing them paradigms. Uh, the way they think. So I just retweeted him. If you're following me on Twitter, at Howard Ferran on Twitter, he's at dentaled underscore global. At dentaled underscore global. Yeah, I bet. Um, so China, um, a lot of people think that's a very closed market, but you're able to get in China? It is a very closed market. Um, the challenges of China, it's a, everything can come out of China quite easy. Nothing goes in. Um, that's and, our experience. And they're not very free on the internet. No, there are there are firewalls. You cannot run a uh, a website out of China or a server out of China without taking a long time to get through. It like it goes through a screening process, and it takes on average about one minute, thirty seconds, one minute before a page opens. So you can't stream anything into China. So we've been able to get around that by working with a partner in China. So And who's your partner? His name is Benjamin Yan. Um, he's in Shanghai and that's we Benjamin Yan. Yeah, I, I guess you would have gone with Godfrey of Modern Dental. S sorry? I, I would have guessed you would have gone with Godfrey of Modern Dental. But you went with this other guy? Yeah. Well he's a, he's a dental ed partner. Um, okay. He's a dentist as well. He's a very successful dentist, and we have in, in, in Shanghai, Sh and Shanghai. we employ two people as well to run dental ed in China, and we do. They've got a very successful study club network. Dental ed is the largest study club network there, um, and pretty popular too. So, got a quite now a what's your what's your um, prediction? Do you think? China will um, loosen the, the internet strings and do you think they'll open up to Google and Facebook but soon or do you think it'll stay a close society for a long time? Well, if Trump has his way, I think we're going to have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, That's what? the easy answer to it. Um, I th It's hard to predict whether China will become open or closed. It depends also on the uh, the 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 governments on how they all get along, I guess. Um, you know, yeah. I think things are slowly looking like they're going a little backward rather than forward at the moment. So, who knows? You know, human history has always been two steps forward, <coughs> one step back. Mm. Two steps forward, one step Correct. back. And I do think we're in a time period of one step back. Mm. Do you? I think so. Yeah. And uh, we we live in strange times, but I, but I always compare uh, this century to the last century. So, this is 2017 by the first 17 years of the last century we already had a world war and the spanish influenza had already killed one out of every 20 people on earth mm. and it's funny how people don't learn lessons because they're flirting with war and so many people are um anti-vaccination mm. and they don't realize that i mean come on a uh, hundred years ago when the in, when the flu season came one out of every 20 people from Indonesia to Guam to Hawaii to America dropped dead. And they were mostly um, the children under five who had never had any partial immunity to influenza. Mm -hmm. And elderly people who are immunocompromised. Philadelphia um, bought its first steam engine during the Spanish influenza because they couldn't dig graves fast enough. So they bought a mm -hmm. steam engine and you would bring out your dead children and grandparents and you'd lay them on the street. And then the firemen would come down, which is a horse and buggy, and they would load the dead people on. And they actually thought there was, it was coming from rotting, uh, stale water mm. on the other side of town. I mean, they, didn't, they mm. didn't even know. And then when they came out with the polio vaccine, <coughs> there were parades, and people were lined up for blocks. Mm. And all those lessons have been forgotten. And now you just have people saying, well, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I don't believe in vaccines. 
We, we, <laughs> we, we tend to have only one generation of memory about our experiences, unfortunately. It, the Second World War wasn't really that long ago. And, you know, there is very high tension again in the world. And it's, it's all about competition and resources. Um, and, and, the, and these wars just snap out of nothing. Mm. I mean, a confrontation in North Korea could all of a sudden have China and Russia and everybody in it in one second. You know what I mean? I mean the, world, that, the world leaders bully each other too much, I think. Yeah, I mean, things can just get out of hand so fast. Mm. So um, you say that you um, are into, um, you like to do a lot of the aesthetics. Mm. The, a lot of the high-end aesthetics. Mm. Um, Pascal mm. and um, all these um, famous people. Um, it seems like also in the markets very big is endo. Because endo seems to be one of those procedures where it seems like half the dentists I talk to, from Kansas to Kathmandu, will just tell you, I hate molar endo. It's, too, it's so hard. It's so difficult. But they have people standing there in pain. I, don't, I have to sell you cosmetic dentistry. Yes. I don't have to sell you to get you out of pain. You, Correct. You, you didn't, so have you, have you, is the endo market, especially hands-on? Well... It's, um, first of all, I just want to backtrack a little bit with about um, endo or people in pain and, and pros. And people in pain um, are different types of patients than those that are not in pain. So, you know, dentists should be aware that when patients are coming in, they're different patients altogether. They're, they're different motivations. Uh, people who uh, require aesthetic dentistry don't need, in their mind, don't, they have choices. And people who need endo want to get out of pain, so they're different types of patients. The question about whether I, you know, is there a need for endo courses? Yeah, there are a need for endo courses. I just think that endo is so well covered in in the training of it on dentists. You know that really it's it's. I mean, you you when when you do more advanced endo training, it's got to do with a lot with the instruments and a lot of new with new technology that comes out. I, I don't know why I haven't really been that excited to be in that field. It probably hasn't, I, I just don't really have a good explanation for it. I just felt that it was always very well covered. Um, to me, I like to be a little bit on the edge, more creative, artistic, and that's probably why I like pros. That's probably like you, why like you like pros. Like yes, aesthetic. Pros. Yes, prostodontics. It's, oh, it's, pros. Yeah, pros. Yeah. Pros. Um, so, aesthetic dentistry. It's so um, <coughs> amazing how. Uh, when when I go to Kansas, I mean when I grow up in Kansas, when I go to Australia and the United Kingdom, how hard it is. I remember to to listen. I, I it's uh, funny how so many times during my lecture I say, okay, ask me that, but ask me that question a lot slower. <laughs> ask me that real slow. And I'm like, because <laughs> so many little words are. If I spoke Australian, you wouldn't understand me. <laughs> oh yeah, and there are there were some there were a lot of dentists down here in Melbourne and Sydney where they start talking real fast and get all excited and oh, the, I, the, I, I the no Queensland the Queenslanders have a more ochre Australian, which is really hard to understand. Yeah, if you're a foreigner, yeah. So so you like the high end aesthetics. So who's mm. the who's the um, hottest speakers in high end aesthetics? I see you got. Uh, Maxim Belg. Oh, that's going to be a little bit tough. He's from the to Ukraine. Put, mm, to put people. Oh, like, plus you, I'll get you in trouble. Yeah, you'll, you'll get me into trouble. I'll get you in trouble. I mean, I do respect a number of speakers out there. All of the people that I've worked with is because the reason why I want to work with them is because I respect the, what they do. So they they are leaders in their area. They they do change the course of, you know, they set new benchmarks, and that's what I like. Um, they think outside the square. They're not they're not normal dentists. They they are very different. And that's why a lot of dentists follow them, because they are different. Um, you know, the likes of Pascal Magnet is a very lateral thinking person, but he's also incredible. Pascal Magnet. Magnet. What, what is, is that Spanish? He is from uh, Switzerland. He is extremely... Switzerland. He's, from, he's extremely popular. He's got a very... So Switzerland's... Half of Switzerland is a German descent. He's French. And he, so he's Magnet. He's French. So that's uh, a French descent. On, and he moved to University of California. He's been there for a long time, um, and his brother, they're, they're a, a, a talented team, both him and his brother, who, uh, whose brother is a very well-known ceramist, and they produced a, a, a beautiful book um, that is really like a gold standard in prostodontics. Um, 
which I don't remember the exact title, but it's uh, it's an amazing book, and it was way ahead of its time, and still stands as one of the best sellers. Um, you know, and and he's an incredible person. He and his brother are extremely talented people. They're just very artistic, and and also very scientific. So it's they're both left and right you know, thinking people, and it's very hard to get that in dentistry. Pascal Mande, here it is. Ryan, you're so good. <laughs> he's always, uh, he's feeding me with the book. Yeah, I like his glasses too. That's a, Yeah, he's, he, he likes that. His image is like a, a nutty professor in some ways. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um, so do these companies, do, do these really high-end people, do they like any certain company's products more than the other? Do, do they all seem to be using one company versus more are they all over the board i think they you know i don't think there are too many dentists who have a strong allegiance to any particular company perhaps at some point in time because they like using the product that that's being developed but these people are evolving people um, and so they will evolve with different products and therefore evolve with different companies so i i don't know that many speakers that remain loyal to one particular company. Do you get a lot of dental manufacturer support for these courses? Yes, we do. We get some, not a lot. We we are independent. We don't. You get more revenue from the dentist or the dental manufacturers? No, we're totally from the dentist, not from the, not yeah. the companies at all. We we hardly get any revenue. Sometimes we do get some support from. Um, some companies, but we don't normally do that. We're do these high-end study people, do they like any technologies more? I mean, like, they, there's a lot of the noise in dentistry is trying to push chair-side milling, mm -hmm. like with CIRAC and all that. Do you, do you see the high-end doctors doing that? or Digital or dentistry. Yeah. You'd say it's digital? Digital. But digital, is that chair-side milling, or is that oral scanning? It's all of it. It's 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 the oral scanning. It's the digitizing things that they've analog. They do analog it away. This is the 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 movement that's taking place now, and it's it will become standard. Um, already, some there's quite a few practices have who've already moved totally into digital. Um, but the the digital pro, uh, processing from say the the clinic into the lab is still kind of analog, but that transition's already starting to happen. So, gone will be the days where you'll be taking an impression and doing a wax up and you know uh, working on a model. That's going to go. That that will be all gone. And you and you start seeing the labs now that are giving you a discount because if you send in an impression, you have to have a human poured up in stone, trim the Correct. dye, do all Correct. stuff. But you send in a digital impression, the first several steps are don't need a human. Well, we're and working so transferring the cost. We're working with one presenter at the moment, um, and you know that's uh, who's introduced this concept called Raw, um, and he's a very talented dentist. And uh, Raw R A W R A W yeah, um, and he he's uh, introduced this concept, and he's he's from Romania. His name's Florin Kofa. And he's introduced basically a total 100% digital, 100 digital workflow for where you scan teeth, uh, create templates, superimpose the template into a patient's mouth when they come in, use DSD, you know what DSD is, right? Yeah, Digital okay. Smiles Design. Is that um, Kevin Coachman? That uh, Christian Coachman. Uh, yeah. Christian Coachman. Yeah. I mean, it's been around for a while, but he, Christian Coachman has the luxury of, of ma perfecting that model a little bit there, and now a lot of people are, are also another using Another Brazilian. It. Yeah, another Brazilian. Um, I've seen DSD earlier than that. I actually saw a, an, an earlier raw form of DSD with uh, Ed McLaren, so an American. So, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw it in the Adobe Workshop. And, um, it was really designed as a lab communicator. Um, it's, a soft, it's really manipulating the data or imagery to, to communicate with a lab. That was the original design of the DSD, but a lot of dentists use it now as more of a marketing tool to get case acceptance, but really the original idea behind it was to get digital form, uh, a digital in, to, uh, picture of teeth, send it to the lab with the measurements and get it all made up. So it was to try and avoid the impression taking. So this guy now, he scans teeth, superimposes the templates, prints them on a 3D model, does a mock-up, sends it off to the lab and then melt. So what he's been able to do is preserve 
the morphology that he scans and prints out exactly or mills exact morphology and fits in the mouth perfectly with all the you know occlusion taken care of and everything so it's already taking place and it's just that's the transition so well, so is he in romania he's in romania yeah he's but, he, he's pushing that idea through is he in the capital uh i don't even know whether what is the it? capital of romania is, <laughs> is, it? is it? Buc bucharest yes he bucharest. is in bucharest yes i yeah. think he is yeah so um yeah and that's where we're going where there's a potential that you know the lab technician's role is going to change very soon and i think a lot of them know it with with the advances of digital technology yeah it is amazing. what i love the most about the digital is um when you scan your prep and you see it on the screen you 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 never you'll never scan your prep without looking at thing oh my god i need to go back and smooth this or do that or you know uh, whenever you get magnification, whether you're wearing loops or whether you're scanning your impression, you see it bigger. Um, ended on us using microscopes. Uh, I see it in uh, surgeons now in hospitals, but just whenever you can see anything a lot bigger, mm. the quality goes up a lot. True. I mean, what's interesting from learning a lot on aesthetic dentistry is the morphology costs a lot to reproduce the better the morphology the more expensive it is and this is where people are pushing the technology to get around that how to bring that cost down and i think that's quite pertinent now cost because of the way dentistry is going the whole economy is changing and the whole dentistry is changing and so you know it's it's got to become more cost effective to do things and a little bit faster and more efficient so you know, I think people are going to welcome the advances of digital technology. Yeah, um, and like we started the beginning of this program, I mean, in the 90s, these guys were booked two or three months in advance. Correct. So you said six weeks was average in the 90s. I would say that was a minimum. A minimum. Yeah. And what is it now in 2017? I think, I would hate to say that, but there are some practices that are out of business now, and there, is, there are many with holes in their books you know with lots of gaps um it's it's changed there there are dentists hurting yeah? oh absolutely yeah yeah it, and it happened faster than what anyone would have expected so so but this is a lesson for dentists to learn around the world because i have heard this lesson in many countries um a president one, one was a governor mm. in um the state of nevada mm. And he told his uh, secretary to get him a dental appointment because he wanted to get his teeth clean. And she came back to him and she said, I, I can't get you in anywhere for like three weeks. Mm. He's like, what? Call, tell him it's the governor. Yeah. She could not get the governor in. So what's the next thing they, they did? They built dental schools. They passed licensure by credential. He, he looked into that and said, okay, well, you can't practice in Nevada unless you take a special license in Nevada. Ax that, you know, build more dental schools. And that backfired on the dentists in Australia when politicians couldn't get in for six or eight weeks. Then they did a deal where they let about a thousand foreign trained mm. Asian dentists come in. They doubled the number of dental schools. And then you had free enterprise market forces like corporate dentistry coming in. Correct. And so um, America, um, um, during the before they started adding all these dental schools, it was about a 10 day wait on average to get into a dental office. And then it started coming down, but it only bottomed at five. Mm. And the last three years, it's back up to like six. Mm. And I, I keep telling dentists that, that your scorecard with the government, you know, I, I can get a pizza delivered in 30 minutes. You know, I, it, it, the government, when, when you tell them there's too many dentists and the politicians can't get into the dentist for 10 days, they, they don't believe it. I think that was perhaps... Um, an explanation to a certain degree as to why things dropped because we were having that issue here in Australia as well where they were bringing in quite a few overseas dentists and um, when you have too many dentists in an area there's only so many patients okay um, that they're all fighting for and everyone was pretty comfortable the status quo had just uh, reached its level and, and everyone was okay or everyone was feeding okay then throw in the GFC What's GFC? The Global Financial Crisis. Oh, that's crisis. right. That's what you guys call the you, 2008 you, you, moment. Correct. 
you throw that into the mix and people lose their jobs and then you know they're really holding on to their money and they're not spending on aesthetic dentistry as much as they used to which is the bread and butter for a lot of practices too then that pie that was accessible once starts to shrink and when you shrink that very quickly like that in the last three or four years that it did and you have the number of dentists in that pool um, then that pie is too small and they, they, you're gonna lose, someone's going to lose patients. And then when you throw the corporates in there as well with their marketing power and their business know-how and a, able to shift patients across to the, to the businesses, then you're drawing away a, that pie away from other practices that probably are not so business savvy. So this is what's happening. Um, those that are not competitive enough and know how to you know it, it's who are not competitive enough and know the, the know-how of business and marketing are, are looking down the barrel well you you just alluded earlier that that was a new area you're going into is marketing well we've always dental aid has always had its foot and roots in marketing um, it's it's something that we haven't provided as our core business, but in some ways we always have in, in a different form. Um, we just know, it, we know about it. Um, and so we, we are producing some tools that could help. I always say that marketing is common sense, but what's common sense to me is not common sense to everyone, isn't it? Common sense is very uncommon. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. I mean, look, look, look at these, um, look, look at these high-profile business people. I mean, you have the, the head guy of GoDaddy goes and shoots a big elephant, mm. and it's like, you know, it doesn't take much common sense to know that you shouldn't be on the front page Correct. Correct. shooting some bull elephant. Um, the head guy of Uber is um, bringing hookers to board meetings. You don't have to be very smart to figure out that some of these things. <laughs> You know, Correct. I mean, remember the most famous dentist on earth is that uh, what, Walter Palmer who went and shot Cecil the Lion? Yes. I mean, I think he got like two million hits on his website yeah. and none of them, none of them were we're positive. Not, we're not pod yeah. patients. Yeah, I mean, there's just some things that um, you just shouldn't do. Correct. Well, one thing that dentists should know uh, now, I think, is that if they're going to go out in private practice, they need to understand what business is and where business comes from and how you get it. You won't be able to survive now. It's it's there. There was this. So are are you are you going to start doing more business courses with well, dental no, I, ED? Maybe we haven't thought of it. We have we have to evolve as well. We have to go where the dentists want us to go as well. We have our core business, but we need to evolve, and we believe that. We've always been in the forefront of helping dentists through education. And we believe that the next phase is to help them survive as well. So um, it's not enough just to do and learn aesthetic dentistry, but you really need to know how to get it out there and, and get the patients. So if you, um, like I say, um, on Dental Town, if you're a baby boomer, you're on the desktop. Mm. If you're a millennial born after 1980, they downloaded the app. Mm. And when you look at the podcast data, in fact, thanks. Uh, um, I really like it when you send me an email, Howard at dentaltown.com. Just tell me who you are, what your age are. Um, but I, I'm, I'm very, very surprised by so many of them tell me they're D2s and D3s and D4s, which is really, um, really cool because I know when I was in dental school, in the D2 second year, nobody was thinking about post-dental school. Mm -hmm. um, but I cannot believe, I got, I got a couple of emails today from D1s. I'm like, you're a freshman in dental school and you're already listening to these podcasts and mm -hmm. all this. All that. But, so anyway, they're all 30 and under. But what, what, did, um, what advice would you give a millennial? Let's say she's 25 years old and she just graduated from dental school. Let's say she was your daughter, 25-year-old your daughter. And she just, um, what would you tell her? Uh, and and I'll, 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 I'll set you up with some more baggage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll set you up with some more baggage. She graduated with uh, $200,000 of student loans. Yeah. And she says, Dad, I want to practice so I can see the Sydney Opera House right out the treatment room window. 
go and do a business degree. Go get a business degree? Yeah. Do a marketing business degree. If that's what you want to see. And what do you mean by that? Well, that, that's going to be very, very competitive. Of course. You're going to have to know exactly what you're doing. I don't think it's enough to be a good dentist these days. In the olden days, you know, you could be a great dentist. I've seen great dentists. Okay, but they're not necessarily good business people. I mean, I've seen great business people who haven't been really good dentists. I mean, they're not and who that made talented. More money? Who and made more make money? a lot of more money. The lousy. Yeah. What would your who made more money? The lousy dentists and good businessmen. Well, a, combina a combination of both is really exceptional, um, and there are far and few between like that. But those people who understand their patients and the business of what they're in, um, and know how to communicate efficiently. Um, and produce good quality work and results um, usually are quite successful and that's the kind of ingredient you need you know how to, you need to know your your business net well you need to know your market you need to know your clients you need to know how to communicate efficiently you need to know how to sell which is a dirty word for most dentists oh, yeah. it's it's a cultural thing instilled at university but you know that's not a true reflection of what's out there when you're out there and you, you run a practice, that's a business. And when you have patients, they're clients. And when you try and provide them a service that they can choose, that's selling. And it's, it's sad because the people that are accepted at dental school, they weren't accepted on any of the skill sets for success. They were accepted because they could get A's in calculus and physics and chemistry. And when you get out, you're not going to use calculus and chemistry and physics. And the skill set um, that will be most successful is if you, you know, have a great chairside manner, can communicate with mm. your patients, your staff. But usually the, the guy sitting in the library, the little Albert Einstein's or Isaac Newton getting an A in physics, usually mm. isn't that person. There, there, there is a, an image that's, that's put on there about um, marketing and selling and in the imagery of dentistry. And it... it it's taught in a way that it cheapens their image and so that's why a lot of people kind of shy away from it that you know we are dentists we we shouldn't be doing marketing because it, it cheapens our image and it cheapens our profession and th that's okay if if you're working within a hospital environment and uh, very clinical and red cross and stuff like that but when you're out there in the in the, in the true sense of a practice or a business and you're you're creating you know restorations and you're you're dealing with people that is a business that's the reality it's not you know it's not a it's not a private hospital here you know people come in on a choice they they have choices you have to stand out you have to be able to communicate you're dealing with people you're dealing with and as I was coming back to before that you have two sorts of patients remember what I said when they're in pain and not in pain the ones that are not in pain can make choices and you're not necessarily treating treat teeth there you're actually you know, if they're coming in and there's no functional problem and they're just not happy about their smile, you're not treating teeth. You're treating psychology. And so you've got to understand that very well and you've got to be able to communicate that efficiently to get people to convert over and, and trust you. Um, and there's 220 countries on Earth. Uh, there's only 100 and... I think there's only 170 at the United Nations, but there's over 220 countries. And some of this advertising and marketing still isn't legal in many, many <coughs> countries. Um, and I, I've always been surprised. Like, I think Romania has a lot of restrictions. Mm. So you're talking about Romania. Uh, I, I've, I've always like Hong Kong's very restricted. There's, it's still a very taboo subject and flat out illegal in yeah. some countries. I, I'm not of the belief that marketing should mean like car salesmen and advertising on on TV, you know, and wait, you get this thrown in. That's not what I believe in. I believe in that, you know, just dentists need to know what business they're in and what they're, how to communicate their skill set to the patients and understand on how to get that trust um, and give them good quality stuff. That's my belief. Um, and yes, there are some countries that don't allow you to promote it and it doesn't make sense in the Western society to do that, especially with what, how things are going, that dentists, you know, there should be guidelines as to what people can do. But, um, you know, I think, I think in most sort of Western countries that there, uh, there are 
laws that allow them to promote it enough to, to get the message across. But it's also what you do in the practice, which is very important. Um, that's really where the business takes place. I also think it's, it's hard for you to teach cosmetic dentistry around the world when there's so many different norms. Like I notice the Americans in the Middle East, my God, they have white bleach. They have neon white teeth. You're talking about the Alabama area? Uh, I mean, gosh, even <laughs> California, California, Hollywood. Oh, um, right. Middle, but, mid, mid, but mid, Middle East, I mean. Uh, yeah, I mean yeah, yeah, some yeah. of the whitest... Californians got a lot of white teeth. Yeah. Some, some of the whitest um, dental work I've ever seen in my life is out of uh, Dubai, mm. Iran. The, the, the Middle East loves white teeth, so mm, do the Americans. Mm, 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 but a lot of people in Europe, um, they, they think that looks like a clown. They, they want it more natural. Yeah. Um, you know, you even seen in breast augmentation in some countries, mm. they look like crazy you know and then other ones are, are um, almost subtle i don't know why there is that um american look uh, versus <laughs> the european look um, but there clearly is two different looks there are two different looks um sometimes being subtle and natural looking is also very good and i think that's there's that mentality and then there's the big and bold uh which america is really well known for um uh, so, I, I think it's a cultural uh, thing more than anything, and I don't know exactly where it stems, but when it comes to white teeth, I think the rule is that your white teeth should not be whiter than your eyes. Well, I remember <laughs> I remember when the bleaching came out, um, um, 3M and Ivoclare had to scramble for lighter shades. Yeah. Because people were, had bleached their teeth so white, they'd have a cavity, and in 1987, 1988, 89, any filling you did on the anterior teeth after they bleached the bejesus out of it looked like a, a dark yellow old filling and <laughs> and they had to come out with bleaching shades and I, I can remember going to dental conventions and um, all these dentists swarming around Bob Ganley saying this isn't white enough there was the CEO of uh, Ivoclare and they're like this isn't white enough we need lot a lot whiter stuff <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm not of the belief of having really, really white teeth. I think it's nice to have white teeth, but not whiter than the eye, your eyes. I think it's just starting to look a bit too abnormal for me. But, you know, I'm, I'm more on the European style, I think. Yeah. Uh, so so um, you were born in Melbourne, but your parents were born in Italy. Yeah. Um, I have. It seems like Italy has more dental implants companies than... I mean, I mean, they're, they're, one, one guy told me that Italy had 90 different implant companies. Is that true or is that not um, true? Or is that an it, exaggeration? It, it's probably a little bit of an exaggeration. I think the, um, is, there's a lot of implant companies and, and uh, there's, they're not all from Italy. Um, there's quite a few from Korea. There's quite a few from China as yeah. well. Um, but there are a lot of small yeah, implant companies. It's amazing how many implant companies there are. And, and the question is, why are there so many implant companies? Is that one of the countries you're in, Italy? No, we're not in Italy. Um, you're not in Italy? No, no, we're not oh in Italy. Gosh, it's, a, it's a Mom language. Yeah, it's not, it's not our market, Europe. Be, the because they're, they're not, um, not really, um, they don't prefer English. Their it's not that, it's just that we haven't reached there yet. Um, we are reaching in the Middle East in the moment, and we are in the plans of going into Russia. So that would so be interesting. So are all your lectures in English? Yes. And and of of the world's dentists, what percent can listen to an English dental lecture? A few. But we haven't translated. In China... Oh, oh you haven't in, translated. Oh, of course. Oh, okay. So, in so China, we, though, it's... Right. I, I call it the rule of um, 50 million. Um, that's the, the um, I, um, if you're born and you have 50 million people to talk to, like in Italy or China or Brazil, well, you don't need a second language. Mm. But if you're born in, like, uh, say, Denmark and there's only 5 million people to talk to, you need to learn how to talk German, Italian, English, Spanish. So by the time the country is 5 million or less, they average, like, 5 languages. Yeah. And by the time it's 50 million or more, they only know their mother tongue because there's no necessity to it. Correct. So is that what you're finding? Most countries over 50 million, you need a translator? Yeah, I mean, yes. We There are still some countries that are not very English receptive, um, you know, but they are evolving. Obviously, English is the 
world's language, um, but there are some countries that are a bit behind on that. Um, you know, China is one of those countries, and and some of the you know um, yeah, so China and um in some of, some of the Southeast Asia regions or um, Asia proper as well. So Japan is the least English speaking nation mm. I've been to. Yeah, it's, it's a little. I, I found far more English in China. Because if you think about it, Tokyo, it's um, it's uh, north of Korea. It's it's halfway between Korea and Alaska. The city Tokyo is on the outside facing the vast Pacific Ocean. Mm. It's an island. It's one of the most isolated cultures known to man. Mm. And it, it's just it's just almost no English on that island. But you know the cutest thing I uh, saw in China ever. <laughs> I was. I was an hour or two uh, west of uh, Shenzhen. I was deep into China. I mean, I was, I was so far back there that whenever, whenever I was walking around, everyone would just stop. I mean, I, I felt like I was a, an alien or a unicorn or you know. I mean, they they would stop. And this little girl, um, it was a, it was at a school, and this little girl, she was so cute. She I don't know how old she was. Maybe she was six years old, and she walks up to me. And she goes, "Usa." And I said, what? She goes, Usa? And I didn't know what she meant. And then my uh, friend uh, starts talking to the little girl, and she learned how to read. And she knew I was from USA. Oh, So right. she phonetically said, Usa. Usa. And I said, yeah. yes, Usa, me, oh. Usa. And she's all excited <laughs> and ran away. I thought that was so cute. Yes, I wouldn't have picked that up. Yeah, that's yeah. good. But yeah, so so you, um, so you're translating. And what, what countries are you translating mostly? China, what else? Um, China really is the only country we translate. We will in Russia as well, yep. um, but in, in China and in Indonesia, we get away with English. Really? Yeah, yeah. Because um, that's a quarter, that's 220 million people. Yeah, they've got a good grasp of the English language in Indonesia. We don't feel like we need translators for the courses. We but you, do, you feel like you need it in Russia? In Russia, we probably do, yeah. Um, and in China, definitely, yeah. What about Brazil? Brazil, we're not there, so I don't know. But uh, Brazilians are not very English orientated. Yeah, and either either is um, Mexico. I mean, Mexico has a hundred million people. So so Central and South America has three hundred million speak Spanish, two hundred million speak Portuguese in Brazil. Mm. They have no need to learn another language. It's, yeah, I, I swear. Yeah, I swear you you'll find it following the rule of fifty million. Yes. Go to a country if they have more than fifty million people. And, and also in the, the rule of 50 million, like say you go to a really rich country like Italy or Germany where they have over 50 million people, but they're all highly educated and know English, they'll still tell you, well, I would much rather prefer to hear it in my native tongue. Mm. And after an hour of translating you know, what you're saying in English to my native tongue in German or Italy or Italian, I, I, I'm exhausted and I have a headache. It's just no. So if you lay down two books for them in Italy or Germany, all the Italians, you know, one's in Italian and one's in English. They'd always pick up the Italian. Yeah. Or the German. Yeah, they do. Yeah. But again, but again, when you get to those countries, 10 million, 15 million people, whatever, they're fluent in English. So, Ferran, that is, that's German background, isn't it? Ferran is, um, well, it's a bizarre name. So, Ferran, almost all the Ferrans are in Lebanon. Right. And it's Arabic for baker. Really? And they can't figure out if a Lebanese man went to Ireland or if a McFerrin changed their name Correct. to Ferran. Uh, because when the Irish um, came to America, the Irish diaspora, about 1850, you know, every immigrant group is heavily hated. And the Irish were among the most hated. And you know why they were the most hated? In America? Yeah. They were troublemakers, weren't they? <laughs> well, what it was is all the groups that came to America were fleeing the Catholic Church. So they were all uh -huh. protesting the Catholic Church. Okay. They were Protestants. They were Lutherans from right. Germany, Fair Mennonites. Enough. They were Quakers. Yep. They were Episcopalians. Yep. They were every group known to man was leaving here. And then here comes the damn right. Roman Catholic yeah. Irish. And when they started building their... Um, churches and cathedrals in like Boston, New York, I mean, all hell broke loose. Yeah. And my um, my great grandmother, um, they kept telling them, you know, you gotta get out of Boston, you gotta get out of New York. So they would went to Ohio and then mine um, went all the way to um, Parsons, Kansas, and they all uh, told everyone that they weren't Irish. They told them they were German 
until World War II broke out, and then they went back to being Irish. <laughs> <laughs> and my great grandmother, who lived to be like 99, she kept a sign um, that said, "Help wanted need not apply if Irish." Right. Yeah. Okay. And and well, the story continues. My um, when my mom, who was Irish Catholic, married my dad, who was um, Protestant. Um, both families uh, didn't approve the marriage, and when they got married, both parents were not for it. And when they had my two oldest sisters, the grandparents didn't even show up. Really? But I was the third. I was the first boy, and that's and what piqued the up. interest of the grandfathers. So they wanted to uh, check me out because I was a boy. And so it was the third child before a Protestant and an Irish Catholic family uh, could speak in uh, the same room in Parsons, Kansas. Yeah, it's, um, Times have really changed. Yes, I think that was 19... Yeah, but... Uh, 19, 1984. I, I was born in 62. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, those were interesting times. Mm, so, you know, good on your parents for breaking the mold. Yeah. They were very forward-thinking people. Yeah. Love conquers everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so what is, so let me, uh, I got you, uh, my there. gosh, we already went over an hour where, uh, we, we went over our hour limit. Um, so final close, um, why should they go to dentaledglobal.com? Well, um, not only do we have good education there as well, um, there's, a, there's a, a list of study clubs there. We've also uh, developed a new product there called My Practice. And My Practice is a pretty smart revolutionary um, system. Uh, have you heard of, have you heard of uh, Infusionsoft at all? Yes. Okay. This is the Infusionsoft of dentistry. It's actually very tailored for dentistry and a lot more powerful as well. Um, so it can do, for example, a survey, which you might think is a basic thing in a practice, an electronic survey. But when you give the survey to the patient, it will do multiple things at once. It will, uh, first of all, uh, assess the patient if they're happy with your service and the practice. And if it does, then it'll open up to Google, uh, Google, ad, uh, Google reviews and it'll also prompt them to Facebook reviews. It'll, um, then it'll also ask for word of mouth referrals. It does it in a very systematic and clever way. It's a very intelligent system. Then it reports back to you in the practice on all the people who've come in and will compare your stats against the national average of other dentists and will also make recommendations on what type of marketing you need for your practice to improve on and where you don't need to improve. So that's just one component of nine modules in this system, and it's a very intelligent system. It's just, it's... A, Infusionsoft is right up the street from me in Phoenix. Right. I'm okay. in Phoenix, I think it's in Chandler, Arizona. Infusionsoft is essentially a click funnel um, software, and it, that's what it does. And it, there are click funnels out there, it's just, neat. It, it's, it's put it in such a way that you're easily able to manipulate it. Um, and that's the beauty of Infusionsoft. This system is like that, but it's very tailored for dentistry. So it has lots of applications for treatment planning. Um, it does, uh, uh, you know, uh, specific information videos. It can actually send a camera over the phone while I'm talking to you, for example. I'll give you an, an example. I'm, I'm a receptionist and you call and you want to inquire about, uh, you know, veneers. And I want to know, you know, the condition of your mouth, basically, or your teeth. Um, and I don't know. And to start that process of communication, I can send a camera to you via, via your phone. And you can take a snapshot and it'll send it back to me and we can be talking about your teeth. But I've also captured your details at the same time. So I can follow through with information. That system starts to take care of that. That's the power of my practice. It's a very powerful system. And then people who are using it are getting very good results. They're the tools that, you know... And they can find all that on Dental ED yeah, Global? Can, yeah, yeah, it's there. Dot com? Yeah. Is it dot com or dot com dot dental ed, It's Dental Ed Global dot com. Dental Ed Global dot com. Nice. 
Well, again, it was an honor that you come by and let Thank you. Um, come on the show and talk to my homies. I'm sure they enjoyed it, and I'm a huge believer in uh, continuing education. I tell people all the time that in the 30 years watching uh, dentists crush it, watching them lose it, the number one variable that I've tracked for dentists crushing it was the ones the, the ones that failed took the minimum 20 hours of CE to get their license reinstated. Like like Australia's 20 hours a year, 60 mm. hours every three years. But the ones that did 100 were doing great. The ones that did 200 or 300 were crushing it. Mm. And, um, and, and as far as going on the uh, hands-on courses, what I like the most about the hands-on courses is you'd be learning a lot about the course, but then you'd be meeting buddies who were also going for it. Mm. And the one thing I noticed early on in uh, Phoenix is that every time you went to a dental continued education, even though the town had, you know, 3,800 dentists in, in the valley, it seemed to be always the same hundred guys. Correct. Going to every one of those courses, and so those guys just hit it out of the ballpark. You're right. You, most of the guys who do dental hands-on courses are the same faces. Oh yeah. And and they don't worry about CPD. In fact, that's why we don't focus on CPD. It's because the people that we deal with, who we believe are the top 10 cream of the crop, don't think about CPD because they do their education, they do training, they love education. And what's CPD? Training. Continuing professional development. CPD, that's the British? The English. Yeah, the English. English. Yeah, okay. Australian perhaps more so. Now is that the United Kingdom, the England, the Great Britain? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thanks again. Yeah, thank you.